um, which is a much better way of putting it because of course algorithms are part of that there and some people have ended up mixing them up with the design one which is all a little bit confusing. So, um, so those are the standards that are available this year and um, the ones that I'm going to focus on are actually the ones coming up at level two which actually match these exactly so that um, there's uh, an advanced, I'm seeing computer scientists and like that, uh, advanced design, advanced programming. Um, as it steps up to level 1, 2, 3, it goes from um, basic to advanced. Or something. Um, okay, so it, how many people here have actually done anything at all to do with the computer science stuff with algorithms and the face evaluation and so on? I mean, in teaching, but no. Didn't work out. Yeah, it, 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 basically, it was a disaster of a year yeah. in terms of mm. trying to teach it. Right, okay. Some of us are here who have taught programming, but we thought we were coming to see. See, coming to see, okay. Yeah. Right, I might talk about something different than what I planned. <laughs> well, what I was planning to talk about was the 2.44, the level 2 computer science. Um, maybe what I should do is a little bit of an overview of the whole thing. Um, how many people are sort of comfortable with all of that? Like, there was nothing new in what I was saying about what those were. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> sort of, yeah. A long time since February, really, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so, to give you an idea of what actually happened this year, these are some stats I got from the NBQA just before entries closed, but I don't think they would have changed much since then. Huge Venn diagram, I'll, I'll talk you through it, but these are the, the three standards that I was talking about. Um, so, computer science, designing a program, and implementing a program. 741 students have registered to do all three of them around the country in 107 schools. 3, 000, more than 3,000 students have registered to do one of them, at least one of them. Uh, and obviously the most popular one was implementing a program. Um, only 38 people learnt or said that they were going to learn how to design a program but not implement it, which is a good thing. Um, I think probably most people would like that number to be zero because it's very hard to design something if you don't actually know what it is. Um, and so Really, these two standards were always intended to go intertwined. You know, design a very simple program and implement it, design a more complex one now that you know what it's on about and implement that and so on. And the reason they were split up is that maybe a student would achieve one and not the other um, simply because they, they could never figure out how to design it and they needed a lot of help, but they managed to implement it or, or vice versa. Um, and also, <laughs> say like me. Um, and, um, but, and, the, and the other thing is that in some schools they might teach that, but not assess it and, and just get on with implementing it. And I, I suspect or I hope that that's what's happened in a lot of these cases where we've got 900 that um, only did programming, but uh, 780 who did both. Um, with computer science, um, we've you know, got a decent number who only did computer science without doing any programming, which is fine, um, because computer science is... Um, so one of the famous quotes about computer science is that computer science is as much about computers it was as much about programming as it is about, as, as astronomy is about telescopes. And the, so the thing with astronomy is that astronomers are always building bigger telescopes and asking for money for telescopes and learning how to use telescopes and so on. But hopefully not many, teles not many astronomers are actually that interested in the telescope. They, they, they're interested in what they can do with it. And it's the same with computer science. Um, and so... Um, yeah, one of the definitions that I sort of made up in the slot just before is um, one definition you can use of computer science is that it's about trying to make computers that are fast, that are easy to use, that are reliable, that are secure and efficient, um, and add a few more if you, that if you want. Uh, and, and so programming is the way that you um, actually get that working. Um, and but but computer science is all the ideas behind it. So let me do a concrete example. Facebook, okay, reasonably successful company. Uh, and what would Facebook be like if it was slow? You know, if you update the status and it came through the next day, um, it would be dead. <laughs> it would be dead. Yeah. What if it was hard to use? If, which it is actually probably. But um, you know, what, what if people would never figure out where the buttons were and if they took the wrong thing, it tells them the rings what they have for breakfast and they don't mean to do that and things like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, what if it wasn't reliable? Um, you know, that you post things but only comes up half the time. 
what if it's not secure? I mean, you know, just one day everyone gets to read everything that you've ever posted. Uh, and, and what if it's not you know, efficient and you know, it, it, it takes... Um, Facebook actually are setting up a site in um, Norway in a town where the average temperature is one degree um, because all their computing needs so much cooling that it's much better to have it you know, in a town like that than somewhere in California or whatever where the temperature, the average temperature is not one degree. Um, and, but, but the more processing that you do, the more power you use. And, and people like Google and Facebook literally set up next, set up next to hydroelectric plants so they can get enough power. Um, and so if you're doing twice as much computing as you do, you're using twice as much power as you need. So, so all of these things are what we care about. I mean, and so, so sure, a programmer can, you can say, oh, just write a program that, you know, coordinates this and that, and, you know, it all comes together. And, um, but, and, and it will probably work. And then we end up with, and you can probably think of examples, some people have mentioned student management systems and so on, which they've got all the functionality, they do everything they need to do, but they're either a pain to use, or they're really slow, or they update slowly, or, you know, whatever. Um, and, and so what, all the aspects of computer science are, are largely concerned with how we actually make it really slick, reliable, and all that. And so all the topics that come up in level one and two are designed to expose students to those ideas. Not that they know how to do that, um, but that they just know that they exist. That it's not just some hacker wrote a program that was big enough that it actually worked, but actually that they threw in a whole lot of techniques like um, in, you know, encryption codes or algorithms that are very fast at searching. Um, so, go back to Facebook examples, it's, it's well known. Um, one of the things that happens in Facebook now is if you start to type someone's name in a search box, um, it, it, it probably suggests the person you're looking for very quickly, even though there's probably a thousand people in the world with that same name. Um, and, it's, and they've come up with an algorithm that's got all these connections and who you're connected to and, and can search them and give us priority to people who are close to you and things like that. And so a lot of these things come down to, to algorithms that will do things very quickly. And there's a lot of very standard algorithms around. And the really standard ones are basically focused on either trying to find stuff quickly. Um, and by the way, computers aren't fast enough that you can tell them to just look through everything and, and see if it's there. Uh, and, and it's certainly not efficient, um, certainly not when you've got millions of users, which you hope. And uh, sorting things in order, because keeping things in alphabetical or numeric order um, is really important. Or some kind of optimization, you know, what's the shortest way to get from here to here, or what's the minimum number of um, items that we need to achieve some goal. So, so that's the big picture of, of, of what computer science is about. And, and the big goal of having it in NCA, at least from my point of view, is that students get to find out that it's there and it's not just some mysterious thing that Mark Zuckerberg knows how to do and no one else knows how to do. Um, and from the government uh, ministry point of view, it's so that we can grow uh, income for New Zealand because... Uh, so... That users, and I'll probably use this with some of you too, but um, it would tough to see that there are only two industries that refer to their customers as users. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and one of those industries you hope you're not preparing the students for, and the other one, well, we, traditionally, computing courses have been very focused on preparing people for everyone nearly will be a computing user. Uh, and and so you can't argue that we shouldn't be teaching that sort of thing because, yep, um, your students will be word processing, they will be logging on online, they will be doing <coughs> things and so on, no matter what sort of industry they end up in. But, compared, but aside, alongside the users, we've got the developers, the people who create the stuff that they use. Um, do I call them the dealers? <laughs> um, but they're the people who build the Facebooks and YouTubes and iPhones and Googles and things like that that millions of people want to use. And as soon as you've got thousands or millions of people using the system, you've got a massive income stream. And at the moment, it's, it's, look, it's always the users will pay for these things one way or the other. You might think that Facebook is free, but Google is free. But you're paying for it, okay, by looking at advertisements. In the same way that TV is not really free, you have to pay for it by sitting through air breaks and so on. Um, or you pay for it because you want to upgrade to more storage or whatever it is that they're trying to to sell you. Um, and, and so for New Zealand as a country, we want to be developing stuff that other people want to use. And maybe a million people will pay us a dollar each to use, or maybe one company will pay us a million dollars so that they can use it or something like that. 
Um, but that's, that's sort of one of the big goals. And, and that will only happen if it is fast and efficient and reliable and secure and all those sort of things. And there are lots of Kiwi companies that have done really, really well because they know how to do all those things. Um, so we want to just sensitize students to, to the idea that, that, that these things exist, basically, um, and that they need not just consider being a user. Um, so, so the purpose of the new material just makes students aware of the science. There's very few high school students would be aware of this. Every time I go into a class in the high school, I ask, and very rarely get anything near a useful definition of what's involved in computer science. The name itself, of course, is really confusing. Um, you know, is it like fluid chemistry and physics with computers, or is it trying to do electronics or whatever? So, so part of it is just to get a feel for what the various topics are by having a taste of them. Um, we, um, you know, want to encourage students to do supplementary work to be a user, um, to be developed as users, and yes, ultimately prepare for tertiary and industry work because these are there are going to be some basic skills and attitudes there. In the last session, someone asked me, you know, how does this relate to the tertiary stuff? A lot of, if, if the student had done really well in all of the standards in level one, two, and three, they'd probably have done a lot of first year university. Um, the reality at the moment is, is that at first year university, we can't assume anything from the students that are coming in in terms of experience with programming and computer science, and so they start um, from scratch. Not from scratch, but from scratch. Uh, and, and so, um, <coughs> some it's a very fast learning curve. For others, of course, they have been doing programming and so on, and it's a slightly slow learning curve for them. Um, <coughs> but ultimately, my vision is that this will end up being a lot like high school physics, where if you're going to do first year physics at university, chances are you've done it you know, right through at school and you're very good at it and, and uh, you'll do it okay. But if you've never done any physics at school whatsoever, you'd probably need to go in a you know, more straightforward program to help you get up to speed. Um, we're a few years away from that, but the state we're at the moment is where I, in, a, in a couple of years' time, hopefully there'll be enough students coming through uh, from the new standards um, that would actually uh, be able to jump past first year very quickly. And different universities have got different ways of doing that. Canterbury, um, a student can just enrol in uh, stage two if, if they've got lots of excellences, if they've got great maths results, if they're obviously a very you know, mature, capable student, they can go straight into, into second year and do a four-year degree in three years. Uh, otherwise, this, most students would do a three-year degree in three years. But with student loans and that, that's a great deal. Um, so, at Waikato, though, for example, that the deal they offer top students, and, and that's already available now, by the way, it's just there's not a lot of evidence that students can reduce at the moment if they're done a whole lot of computer science. But at Waikato, they have a scholarship in year 13 uh, exam. And if the students do well in that, they go on a particular class that's designed for those students. And so they're still doing first year, but a much more exciting, challenging class for that group. And, and they're kind of earmarked as they go through this you know, the group of students. So, um, you know, even from now, this is going to help the students. Um, the, the topics that have been chosen um, are largely based on international curricula and so on, but just going to, um, you know, one authority on what you should do is Wikipedia, and if you look up computer science in Wikipedia, it gives us this list of stuff that you know, broadly covers computer science. No two computer scientists will agree on exactly what the list should be, but just as one benchmark, um, theory of computation doesn't, doesn't really come up much in the standards, but information and coding theory, that's going to be in the level 2 standard. Um, algorithms was in level 1. Programming language theory, not, not programming, but understanding why languages exist and what you do with them and how you use them. Uh, that was in level one. Formal methods isn't there. Some of these don't, don't appear for various reasons. AI is in level three at the moment in the draft. Um, graphics and visualizations in level three. Security and cryptography at level two. Um, and, and software engineering um, appears in, in level three, but the programming that they do in level one and two help inform those things. But see, so when you look at a list like that and you say, well, if that's kind of what one person thinks computer science is, someone who's done those standards, 144, 244, 344, as they go through, has had a taste of all those. Now, the computer scientists that we produce at university um, will actually be able to do those things. What we want um, from the students in NCA is really to understand what those things are and what the issues are. Um, so, uh, one of the 
topics here, for example, artificial intelligence. You're probably not going to produce a student who writes artificial intelligence systems or something like that. But, uh, oh, oh, sorry, I introduced Heidi, who's one of my students from uh, university. Um, who's, uh, I've got a class of, is it about 10 students or something? Nine students? It who? was 12. 12, okay. <laughs> it's a long time ago. Um, who did nothing but study computer science education for the year. And one of their projects was to write um, designs for that would be useful for NCA or computer science education, so like lesson plans or assessments of resources and so on. And a lot of those have ended up uh, on the NSAC website. Um, and, and others are, are going to be adapted or get a more palatable format. So one of the things I did was look at AI and say, how could a year 13 student meaningfully study AI? And came up with what about five main questions you could ask them? Um, well, it's four main topics. Yes. And it was sort of broken down to a bunch of questions. Yeah. It's still not complete yet, but. Yeah. And we don't need that until next year. So, yeah. so that's one of the party's jobs over the summer. There's a few good topics here, though. So. Yeah. Um, but you can ask questions like, well, what is AI? But then things like, um, is there a danger that computers will take over the world? And there's all the ethical questions that come with that. Um, there's this question about where are we up to now? What is AI used for right now in industry? And, and it is used for various things, making decisions and so on, uh, quite useful for us. And, and, and so to, to explore the topic from that point of view and understanding um, what it means, um, you know, graphics and visualization, you know, what, um, for, for face recognition systems, someone could do a whole project on that. What is the current standard for face recognition? What if I get some face recognition software and put on a moustache, does it still recognize me as the same person if I put on glasses? And they can play around with that and experiment with it and say, and basically get an idea, okay, these are the kind of issues, this is what free software can do. CIA, CIA can probably do something a bit flashier than that, but you know, where are we at with that topic? So, so they end up coming out with this sort of broad overview. Um, a lot of the resources and ideas that I'll talk about today, um, all of them actually, uh, we post on this resources site for on NZACT. So, how many people are aware of this from the state Right. Um, so, we had a contract with the ministry we halves with all the universities in New Zealand. Um, so, um, every university paid Canterbury money, which I thought was very cool, um, to put together uh, a huge list of every resource we could find that was relevant to the Level 1, 2, and 3 standards. And level 1 has been there since last year. Level 2 is nearly all there, and the rest of them will probably appear this week. Level 3 um, is on its way. Um, but for a particular topic, like if you're doing Level 1 programming and you chose the language Visual Basic, then there's a list of dozens of websites and resources and downloads and things like that. Um, nearly all of it's free. Occasionally refer to books or something that you have to subscribe to, but nearly all free. A lot of videos, that sort of stuff. Um, and you just go to NZACTIF and choose resources, and down here it's got programming and computer science. Um, and some of these are, are just huge. Some of the topics we've got, like literally, if you printed it, about 20 pages of links and resources and so on, um, which is all a, a, a bit overwhelming. Um, but the, um, at the top of it, what we've done is put our facts. So we've picked about five to 10 sort of uh, the ones that we think are just no brainers is just go for it with the class. This, this really nails the, the topic. As you go down the list, you know, if you're looking for something in particular, like maybe an interesting YouTube video to show about the topic, there'll be a whole list of YouTube videos that we thought were relevant at that level. Some of them come with a bit of a warning, you know, like you know, the first couple of pages are really useful and the next 98 pages will be really scary and just don't touch them. Uh, things like that. But, uh, and, and, and we need to refine the list. It's so big that we, you know, we can't keep track of it. So if you spot something that you think should be on the list, or if you think if you're using it and you find something you think is way too crazy for you know, using it in New Zealand schools or there, um, just leave us a note. Um, but, but it is huge. There's um, months of work has gone into that. And, um, a couple of research assistants working on that. Um, and still working on it. Um, so, well, where do we start? Um, maybe I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll talk to you a little bit about level one computer science. Um, there are th when you look at the standard um, for this, there are three main components to it. One is comparing different algorithms. Uh, the next one is looking at the function of programming languages, and the third one is human-computer interaction. Um, 
They actually also comes up at the level two one as well. So at level one, it's just a very simple assessment of, of an interface. Um, but at level two, it's a more, slightly more formal assessment. Um, now, with all of these things, they, they have to do it as a project. Um, the rules say no more than 14 pages, uh, and it must be a area of 12 points. Oh, an interesting way. Uh, and the, um, the reality is that 14 pages would almost be way too much in almost every case from talking around people who have been involved in this. About five pages, five or six pages, the excellent students are producing five or six pages. And, um, now, so the thing is that the standard says that the student will give an, demonstrate an understanding of, um, and different levels of understanding of, uh, as in comparing and contrast to just defining or whatever, um, these topics. Now, how do you demonstrate an understanding? A really bad way to demonstrate an understanding would be to look it up on Wikipedia and paraphrase it. Okay. Um, it just because, in my experience, what that's likely to end up with is you take something that was fairly correct and written in a very abstract, um, high level way and turn it into something that's half wrong. <laughs> and, 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 and the student clearly doesn't understand it. Um, a really great way of doing it is to actually get your hands on some of these things and do them and, and, and personalize it. So a really simple one, um, interface evaluation, is to find an interface that you know, is unique to you. So here's an interface that was lying on the desk here. Um, it's a digital interface. This thing transmits digital codes to that thing up there. Um, it's got button. And, and so, so now, let's look at how we would use it. And, and this is a key thing. With the, a bad description of this interface is it's got 18 buttons, a red, and a red one and an orange one, and it's nicely laid out. Okay. A good description would be the typical tasks I do with this interface are what? Switch on the projector. Zooming and yeah. adjusting and so on. Turn it off again. Freezing the picture. Freezing yeah. the picture. And hiding the picture. Hiding the picture. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and, and you would talk to a user, you know, which might be, in this case, a student might talk to a teacher about what they use and say, okay, what things do you have difficulty with this? Who, who never has a problem getting the data projector switched on and off and frozen? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what problems do you have with it? The biggest problem was the first time we use it, you keep on pointing at your data, and for some reason that works. <laughs> yes, I was warned about this. You meant to point it at the screen. Yeah. Because yeah. the whole point was different. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Some of them, if you don't point it at exactly the right angle, it just doesn't say. Right. Okay, so pointing at exactly the right angle. You don't know if the batteries are flat or not. Right, there's no feedback about whether the batteries are flat. And, and when you look at what makes a good interface, a good interface gives you feedback. Uh, and it gives you very quick feedback. Often with a projector, you press the on button and the only feedback you get is one minute later, something will slowly appear on the screen. Right, and so a good interface, at least something will happen straight away. And maybe, there's, maybe there should be a light on here so that if that doesn't come on, you know, the battery's back and so on. And now we start to look at what does someone actually do with it and, and what frustrates them and how do they use it and so on. So, if, if, you know, if you take a different interface like a cell phone or text messaging, um, and one of the ones I really recommend is just give it to someone who's not familiar with it. It's very easy for something that you're familiar with to say, oh, it's a great interface, I can do everything really quickly, <laughs> particularly for a teenager. Um, but give it to mum or dad or a grandma or granddad and, and say, okay, here's a text message interface. Just type in my name in the text message interface. They will get a five page report just out of that. Um, but why, and, and the thing is to be a non-judgmental assessment of what that person is doing. You're assuming that it's a fairly intelligent person. Right? Um, you manage to get first here and bring you up and things like that. You manage to get a job as a teacher or whatever it is, or you're a classmate. But why did you press that button? Why? Like, you know, and the person will say, oh, I was trying to get the letter T and it keeps on sticking on H or something like that. And you know, how do I delete this? Well, now I still the whole thing. Okay. And, and you take note of all those. What were they thinking? What, made, what led them to do those false moves? I mean, this is someone I actually trust to drive a car that could kill people, right? Now. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, the delete button is right by the send button on my phone, for example. I mean, how many times have I sent a message to the program to delete an insult or something like that? Um, so, so, but, but 
But what I'm really talking about is here, this is how you personalize it. You can actually get someone to do something with this thing. In the case of interfaces, you can get someone else to do it. And you just report on it. And that, that's not very easy to authenticate. You know that the student's done it. You know, um, you, but the, what the, the conclusions they draw will probably be very similar to other people. You know, people bump buttons that are near each other. They can't find the off switch. They forget to do this and so on. Is that suggestion on the tiptoe website? Um, yes, it is. So those sorts of things can be there because in reality it's very, very hard to teach these things. Yeah. And my method of teaching is this is how you um, go to Wikipedia and you now type in algorithm comparisons and just paraphrase what's there, you know. Okay. So in other words, I don't know how to teach this stuff. Right. And you have these fantastic ideas and like, hey, that's a really neat idea. But I'm going to have forgotten that neat idea, or that's the only neat idea I'll remember. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Now we've put up a lesson plan for level one. Mm -hmm. um, that says basically do it. Well, so we start off with this wonderful idea that we'll just list every resource and it's a free country. So teachers can pick the best one. Yeah. And we realise that they haven't actually got all that much spare time. Yeah. Enough. Um, so we got down a few resources and then we realised that actually they haven't got that much spare time. So we said, just do this. <laughs> um, and I think 80% of the teachers said thank you for sure after. Yeah, yeah. The other 20% said, oh, yeah. 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 So, yes, we are doing that. And, um, but, uh, and, but for level two, I'm just thinking, job for some of my students this summer. Yeah. <laughs> A list of just do this. Because um, there are a ton of really cool things to do out there. Um, so, yeah, for level one, algorithm comparisons. Um, and, I mean, this stuff is really interesting. Um, you know, I think the also, which is, um, no, just, I'll jump into a little, I'll, I'll just give you a little taste of this, right? Oh, for those who want to do heaps of this, um, so Google have paid for it for two days of computer science in December 11 or 12? What was it? Right about it, Monday, Tuesday um, in December. Um, and so please come along and enjoy it, and it's just a whole. You know, be heaps of this, all these ideas floating around, um, as well as <coughs> free lunches and Google engineers talking about how this is used for Google. Can we put it in the book? Uh, sorry? Oh, yes, you have, you have seen the book. Um, it's at Canterbury University. Um, it's, I've mentioned it on NZ about a week ago, um, and registrations will go out probably late this week for the way things are going. Um, and it's first and first serve, so watch out for it. <laughs> um, it's first and first certain that Google have given us a certain amount of funding that will cover all the food and, and accommodation because it will be a lot of our farm teachers as well, that's a national thing. Uh, it's also run in Wellington in January, so if December's not good for you, you can go to Wellington in January as well. Same thing. Similar, almost any thing. Um, and once we run out of funding for places, then I think it's $150 a head roughly to register for it for a few days. It includes meals out and all sorts of things. Um, they've been doing it in America for about five years now. In fact, we've been providing a lot of material for it, and they finally decided that maybe they should do it here, so they probably good to do it. Yeah. What's the content going to be on that time? The content? Yeah. Uh, 144, 45, 46, 244, 45, 46. Okay, so programming and computer science. So no media, no information systems, all that sort of stuff. It's just the same as what I'm talking about today. Did you want to register where you go to? To register? Yes. Um, I'll email it to the NZ website. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What about like our uh, program? It's going to be for everyone, and what I'm looking at doing is we'll have some parallel sessions for those who. Yeah. You won't learn programming in two days. No. Um, what it's about is why you would want to teach programming, and sort of what, what language would you want to teach, and a ta you know, a taste, you know, this is what Scratch looks like. Who's been teaching Scratch this year? Just that interest. Did it work? Was it cool? Yeah. Uh, who's been using another language this year? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, different people. Oh, different people, sorry. Python. Python, yeah. Um, Scratch and Python are the ones that I'd be recommending. And that's the sort of question to the fire again. Uh, but, yeah, we'll be talking about all those sort of questions and what is Scratch and what is Python. Um, for those that have already done that this year, we'll put them in another room on their own and with a few experts and say, well, if you work out what worked or didn't, and write something about it and give it to the other people. <laughs> this is just do this, don't do what I did. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, that's very roughly what it is. Um, and 
in effect, in the registration form, we'll be asking a few questions about, about that too, so that we can play around. Okay. Right. Um, so, 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 let's very quickly, uh, and, and by the way, I'm not going to look at um, 45 and 46, designing a program and, and writing a program today. Um, and in fact, the people that really know a lot about this is guys like Anthony Robbins at Otago and Peter Andre in Waikato, uh, no, Victoria. Um, and um, they, have, they have thought about this long and hard and got lots of cool examples and you know, argue all sorts of things about the best way to do it and so on. And we'll have at least one of them along with each of those workshops as well. So that, they're going to focus on that. So my focus is a lot more on the 144, the, the ideas from computer science. And the exciting thing at level two is that, um, the, the, well, there's two exciting things. One is that the project works out really well to combine all of them into one project on one topic. And the other one is that a lot of the topics make great programming exercises. Um, these things like um, understanding binary numbers, or well, writing a program that converts things to binary numbers is a nice exercise if you're into that sort of thing. Um, checking the digits in a credit card, if they're accurate. Um, writing a program that you can type in a credit card number and it tells you if that's a valid credit card, and things like that. Very simple sort of problems, but a lot of them are you know, good exercises to go between the different standards. Um, Okay, so, get, so I'll focus on computer science now, which is the um, 144 standard. So the first thing was compare algorithms. Now an algorithm, oh, right. I love this, I'm not teaching properly, I'm not going to assess today so I can jump all over the place. Um, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're about to write a letter. Um, the, yeah, one, of the, one of the reasons I got involved in this is for years we've run a program called Computer Science Unclub, so, um, which has been translated into 16 plus languages and used all around the world, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, but the main point about it is that it's for 5 to 12 year old kids, and nearly all the concepts that appear in NCA have actually been, we've been teaching for years to 5 to 12 year old kids. Teaching them to teenagers is a little bit harder, um, believe it or not. Um, but uh, we were, and, and, and we can't just use that, we need to have slightly deeper concepts and that sort of thing. But one of these shows that we did as part of Kids Fest on, on um, the towards the end, of the, the girl put her hand up and, and she kind of said a question. She would have been about nine years old. And she said, sure. You know, and uh, she said, why do you use such big words for such simple ideas? And I, that floored me, actually. Yeah, that was very cool. And, and the best answer I can have is so that I can make people think that I know people so that I don't really think things like that. Um, and, and so what I've prepared, what I've found talking to lots of teachers over the last few years is that this is really this new stuff. It's stuff that we haven't been trained in. It's stuff that, um, I mean, I think there's probably, I'm guessing, six people in the country, six teachers who have degrees in computer science. And two of them in this building at the moment. Um, this one's in this room, not me. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and, and so, and you get given all these words like human interaction and, and, and compression and encryption and algorithm and logarithm and, and stuff. And it's like, it's just a big alphabet soup, I, I imagine. Um, and, and so, um, what, what I, what I, one of the things I've produced that I think will help is this handout which is called Big Words for Simple Ideas. I really wish I got the girl's name so I could think of the, the title. But um, well, most of the, well, you know, nearly all these things can be explained you know, very straightforward ways with some of the right examples. Um, so I'll, I'll pass this round. I don't, ex this isn't intended to be like, you know, you, this is all you need to teach is everything on the sheet or just you know, this in your own computer science. But what I did do with Heidi Self, thanks Heidi, is um, try and identify all the, cons all, all the big words you're likely to come across in level one to three. Um, and there'll be a lot that you will be familiar with, yet, and, and, and I don't imagine that we've really caught everything. But these, these are the words that come up, these are the concepts that we want students not to be able to, you know, get a job working for a large, you know, to trade me or something, running security, but just to know what the security issues are. Um, so, by my opinion, if, if each of these words ends up making sense to you by the end of your PD, which well, it never ends, but anyway, if, if most of these words end up making sense to you, then most of level one to three will make sense. Um, hopefully after today, a few more of these words will make sense than they did a little while ago. Which reminds me, what time do they promise you lunch? Oh, I'll go and check.
Um, the, the, the numbers and square brackets at the end of each definition is the level at which that topic comes up. Um, so, um, so your colleagues who have taught level one will probably be familiar with some of those terms. And, and so one of them there we have is algorithm analysis. Um, now, so if nothing else, you can go home and say, oh, we just algorithm analysis. We went back to the University of Algorithms today from a digital technology teacher. Um, the complex, so an algorithm is a process for, for getting something done, and if we were doing level one, I probably would have brought a few more toys with me, but I have got videos actually. I'll see if I can find the video of this. So, one of the things that we do a lot with algorithms is um, sorting things into order. It just keeps on coming up all the time, and uh, so. And, and, and a lot of the ideas um, with sorting come up in the algorithm. So the way that we do it in an unplugged way, and, and this is the level, this, if the students understand it, this level will get um, is we give students some balance scales and a bunch of weights, and they're all different weights. They're film canisters, which are very hard to get these days, since um, with different numbers of two cent coins in them, which are actually so hard to get. And um, what we've done is that. Um, and the, the way I, I, I teach this with kids is that we just give them the weights and say, find the heaviest weight. And this is, as far as I know, this is about the first time this kid's ever done this. We said, find the heaviest. And what he's done is he's you know, sort of comparing them all. And whenever he finds one that's heavier, he um, puts it to one side. Okay? So, so he's found the heaviest weight. Mm -hmm. He had 11 weights here. How many times did he have to weigh stuff to find the heaviest weight? And he, he, yeah, ten times he weighed, he did ten comparisons. Okay, <coughs> you've just analysed the complexity of finding the heaviest weight. Okay, so complexity just means how long it takes. Okay, can mean a few other things, but it primarily just means how long something takes. And in fact, even without him doing it, we had a counter here that was telling you how long it's taken. Um, but you would hope that, you know, okay, so if I gave him a hundred weights and I asked him to find the heaviest. How many comparisons would he have to make? 99. 99. Okay, you've analysed the complexity of finding the heaviest of 100 items. If I give him n items, this is for excellence, by the way, and how many comparisons would he make to find n minus one? N minus one. Okay, done. You've analysed the um, algorithmic complexity of finding the heaviest item. Okay, that's what it is. Um, of course, we have, and, and at level one, that's. That's the kind of stuff that I'd like the students to be able to do. And, and now we can answer things like, well, if we gave them a million, how long would it take? And you can give me an answer that if you've got a million and one, it would take a million comparisons. You know straight away. The experimental approach is, well, we'll write a program, and we'll, we'll make them do it, and we'll come back and find out how long it was afterwards. Okay? So the theoretical approach, which you've, you've now become, when you analyze it and you work out how long it would take, um, can be a lot faster than making them do a million things. Now, the real problem we're trying to do here is sort things into order. So he's got the heaviest one, but if we want to get them you know, in order from lightest to heaviest, what are we going to do next? Sort out the heaviest of the next ten. Right. So, so that's the heaviest of them all. If you find the heaviest of that one, you can put it there, and you'll have the second heaviest, right? And then the next one, and so on. So if I, um, yeah, we can make them do it, or... So you just told me that the first time through we made 10 comparisons and we found the heaviest of those 11. Oh, now I've got 10. How many comparisons? Nine. Nine. And then? Eight, six, seven, Well, that's where he's down to two. And then when he's got one item, how many comparisons does he need to find the heaviest of one item? Zero. Yeah, we can put zero in if you want, but the kid himself will probably realise I've got one item, I know it's the heaviest, I'm not doing anything. Okay. What's the sum of those numbers? Well, actually, a, a good trick is we write them backwards. 10 plus 1 equals 11. 11. 11. 1 plus 2 equals 11. 11. 1 plus 11 equals 11. How many, tops, how many lots of 11 have I got? You've got more numbers than one side or the other. I can't count. The last number should be 10. 
Oh, I, I, I Eight. Eight. Excellent, right. I was just trying to see if you're aware. <laughs> okay, yeah, so 10 lots of 11. So the sum of that is 10. So the sum of that is? We're awake still. Well, 110, it's the same numbers. Yeah. Get it done. You wrote that 100 bits on that all well, it's only November and I'm giving this answer. Yeah, so, so, so what's the sum of those numbers? Half, half of that. What's half of 110? Okay, so let's see. That's the, you did the analysis of the algorithm. You're predicting that we've taken 55 comparisons. We may even do it. We just speed up the video. <laughs> And, and, and so the report on, on this would be, you know, I took 10 weights or 15 weights or 8 weights and I compared these and, you know, a few photos and things like that. And in this case, it took 55 comparisons. But you knew that in advance. You'd done the analysis of the algorithm. Okay? Um, by the way, if he had 1,000 weights, and maybe it wasn't the kid by the computer that we got to do it, how many comparisons would it do? Well, in fact... You could work out, you know, 1,000 plus 99 plus 99. Each of these rows is going to add up to 1,001. Thousand. Thousand How many rows would there be if there was 1,000? 1,000 rows. And we have to divide by 2 because we've double counted everything. Well, it's just 500 times that. Right? So it's 500,000 and 500. So in other words, if we've got a kit to sort a thousand things that way, it would take them half a million comparisons, yeah. roughly. And, and one of the interesting things is that, you know, we've, we've got, we've, we've gone from, okay, so that was 55 comparisons for 10, we've given them 100 times as much stuff, but it's not 100 times as long, because 100 times as long would be about 5,000 comparisons. It's actually 500,000. This is a method that gets out of hand as you get more and more stuff, and that, again, that's what we want the kids to do. So if, they, if they plot a, a graph, what they'll find is that, in fact, you've got a square here. Okay? Um, and, and, and so it's, it's fine down here, it doesn't take long, but as, as n increases, you know, we get up to 1,000, we've worked it out to 10, um, the number of comparisons there is 500,500, the number of comparisons here is 55. Um, and, and they plot a few other points along the way, and they realize that this is going to go through the roof. Uh, and so if you were, say, Facebook, and you had a system that was sorting all your users into order, and you check it on 10 or 20 or 30 users, it's going to work fine. No, it's not going to work fine, because as soon as you get 1,000 users, everything's going to run really slowly. And if you get a million users, which actually turns out to be the case, um, then everything is going to just grind to a halt. It's going to take forever to work. And that's the kind of prediction a computer scientist makes straight away. They say, oh, hang on a minute, you can't use that algorithm. You can't just keep on finding the heaviest. Because if you are successful, it's going to fall over. And there were social networking sites competing with Facebook that fell over when they got too many users. Not particularly because of this algorithm, but because of that kind of issue. Happening. And so that's what we want to sensitize students to, is the idea that um, just because something works in the classroom, you need to predict. And, and so this group of people here who can, probably can even know what analysis of algorithm meant 10 minutes ago, correct? Some of you? Um, have predicted it will take 500,000 comparisons and people 55. And yet, with almost all of our teaching, we only ever teach with a small number of examples. We teach yeah. database, we get 10 examples, or yeah. you know, if we're doing a spreadsheet, we have yeah. you know, five lines in the sum at the bottom. We never do a spreadsheet that has you know, 50,000 things that you're adding. So welcome to computer science, because I think one of the things that computer science is about is scalability. Uh, if you look at these companies that are successful, Google, Trade Me, Facebook, whatever, um, scalability is at the heart of what they do. If we can make it 10 times as big and only use 10 times the resources, but we're going to have 10 times the amount. If, in this case, 10 times as big means I need 100 times the resources, you're, you're doomed your system. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. When you do something on a whiteboard or a screen or something like that, you just can't do that. Um, and that's partly where analysis comes in. You can just do this mathematically. But for your students at their level, that's fine because what they will find is if they were trying to do this by hand, um, it, it just blows out after a while. What I did with um, 
some students. We've, we've got these programs in Scratch. So there's a Scratch program here, advertising program on the executive side that do this particular method of sorting. It's called selection sort because you select um, the largest value, then the second largest, and so on. You can your kids can download it uh, and run it on their computers. And so I had a whole class um, running this sorting algorithm. And I just first get like, you saw 10, you saw 20s, and, and we had a couple of kids at back school in 200. Um, and the ones of 10, they came back straight away, and we typed them into a spreadsheet and said, oh yeah, that took you know, one second, two seconds, three. The 50s, after about five minutes, they were starting to come back with results. The, the hundreds, uh, this was because scratch is really slow. Um, but nevertheless, um, the 200, <coughs> I think it was about 200, it never finished within the period, um, because it takes about an hour or so to do that. And to me, that's where the lesson hits in. It's like, okay, my 200 was only 10 times bigger than the guy with 20. The 21 took like, five seconds. Why didn't my one take 50 seconds if it took 50 minutes? Um, and, and so it's, it's just sensitizing them to the, the, these strange effects happening. And then your excellent students will see that that's actually n times n minus 1 over 2. Uh, and even that terminology doesn't need to come up, but they get the feeling of this, what, what's called quadratic um, uh, complexity. And it, you just can't use that. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's sort of almost beyond excellent, some of those, those things I've talked about. Um, there's another approach called quicksort. Um, so the girl is about to do that. Again, I never expect your students to, to implement this. One or two more. Um, but all we told her was, Pick one of the weights at random, put everything that's lighter in it on, than it on one side, everything that's heavier on the other side. So she's divided up into three piles. The one that she chose at random, the stuff that's heavier, and the stuff that's smaller. Just to, to cut to the chase, this is one of the fastest algorithms known for sorting. Okay. And it seems kind of weird, but... The, so, so she hasn't sorted them yet, but we do know that that are four smallest, and they're the five, six largest we are. And that one goes in the middle. So now all she has to do is sort those ones in order and sort those ones in order. How's she going to sort these ones in order? Same way, quick sort. Okay. Now that's kind of mind blowing, and, and no way your students need to worry about it too much. But for a few, that may kind of get them quite intrigued. Uh, this this girl could cope with it. We said, okay, just do the same to that group. Pick one at random, put everything that's heavier on one side and everything smaller on the other side. Um, okay, and then do that to all the groups that you end up with, and eventually she gets down to one item, and one item is sorted. So you just leave it there. And she did the same on the left hand side. This is on YouTube. Um, and in this particular case, it took 27 comparisons, whereas the boy needed 55. So is this method twice as fast? Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. It was in this particular case. Um, but what if things had gone wrong? You know, what if she picked the wrong thing? You know, all this is. Anyway, um, now, again, this program we have available, that students can just download it, um, they can run it, and what they'll find is that this method is almost always much faster than selection sort. And that's all we want them to do. They don't need to know how it's working, but it, it is kind of nice to have a rough idea of what's going on there. But, but that bizarre approach to things um, actually make, gives you a program, and it's not twice as fast, by the way. If you for this line, it's, it is roughly twice as fast down here somewhere, in fact it's almost a little bit slower way down here, which means that, for example, it's often gives you the wrong result. Um, but when you get up here, it goes like that. Um, it, it's, it doesn't increase at the ridiculous rate of this one, it, it, it increases at a much steadier rate. And so when you get up to a million, it's still at quite a reasonable speed, whereas this one here is just like you never contemplate doing it. And so again, half the class might be running that one, and half running the other one. And, and the ones that are using Quicksort, they, they, they're sort of a thousand numbers or two thousand numbers, no problem. Whereas the, these guys are only managing to sort fifty numbers in a short amount of time. And, and again, it, the only message is that there are two algorithms, and one is clearly going to be much better than the other. Um, and always watch out for this. And anything that you do, don't just write a program. But you need to think about what technique you're going to use for that program. Um, Another very simple example that I've used for this, um, and, and this is just a different way of teaching the same thing, so if you either one of both, is with a phone book. Um, and so looking something up in a phone book, most people can look things up in a few seconds. 
turns out a lot of kids have never seen on these days, but it's <laughs> introduced them to us. But um, I've, I've got a phone book that um, I've got a print as a book binder, and he rebound it for me in a shuffle order. And uh, so I, I give it to people to, to look at. Actually, I, I met someone on the weekend who I was talking about with this, and he said that um, when he was a teenager, um, he had a girl that he was really fond of, and he knew a phone number, but he didn't know your last name. <laughs> <laughs> I think he said it was two and a half days that it took him to go through every number on the phone book and find her phone number to figure out her last name. Mm-hmm. Don't know. I don't know if you can use all the examples I'm giving you in class, but if he knew her name, and he'd be able to look up her number in a few seconds, but if he, you, know, you know the number, you can't look up the name really quickly. And, and the method where you go through every single n- number to find your girlfriend's number is is called linear search. You go through from beginning to end, and if, the, if it was the New York phone book and it was 10 times as big, you would expect to spend how much longer? 10 times longer. Whereas if you are doing a thing where you, you look at the middle page and you decide if it's in the left half or the right half of the book, okay, if the book's twice as big, how many more pages are you going to have to look at? One more page, because looking at the middle one divides it into a problem half the size. Okay. So, and and that's, a, that's another great example there. Just going through every value is ridiculously long. Having it already sorted, not how we talk about importance of sorting, means that you can find things really, really quickly. Um, so um, there's also like these websites that have got simulations of sorting, and I know some classes have done this, but just got the kids to watch the sorting happening and time it or count what's happening and so on. And, and then you get these individualized projects where they say, oh, I tried to sort this thing, I went to this website and counted these, and here's my my spreadsheet graph, or here's a list of the numbers, really badly presented, uh, whatever it is. But something that gives evidence that they understand the concept that some algorithms take more time than others. Uh, and, and then for the, for the merit and excellence, I think it is that it's a function of the end. So for, um, for achieved, it's just simply, I ran these two things and that one was faster. But for the excellence, we're looking at someone saying, you know, that, that it's obviously much better to have something like that. Right, and then, so there's just so many cool ways to teach this stuff and because it's demonstrated that I'll go into more at this point. Um, the interface stuff, um, so human community, I've talked a little bit about interfaces, we analyze that data projector thing. Incredibly simple interface, and yet we could write probably two pages about frustrations and ways that could be improved and so on. Um, excellence at level two is suggesting ways to improve something. That way. Um, so at level one, um, one of the suggestions we've got on the site is this thing here called a, a cognitive fall through, um, which CS for fun is a very cool site if you haven't come across it. It's computer science for fun. Um, they have a lot of magic tricks and games and write ups about concept of computer science and how they apply to the stuff that kids will have seen. It's a, a, a British thing that's got massive European funding, so it's, it's really glossy and really nice. Um, but, so one of the, their activities that, that we gleaned and put in our list of super things, cognitive ball through, which is kind of what I was talking about. Um, so pick a gadget like a phone or an MP3 player um, and, and, and then basically think of a task that you want to do and you write down the, the sequence that you have to do to follow it. But, and you know, then it's got a list of questions, which is basically, you know, was it obvious what to do next? If you made a mistake with what you pressed for that thing in the sequence, did it actually make it really hard for you to go back where you were and things like that? Um, so, oh, actually, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, and, and then the, the other topic at level one is programming languages, and that's the main concepts there are the idea that um, if you write a program in a language like um, Scratch, then there's an interpreter that runs it. Right? Um, whereas if you write in a language like, um, say, C or whatever, then there's a compiler that converts it to something that the machine language that would run on the computer. So if you write a C program, you can't run it unless you've got a compiler that, that then converts it to something on the computer. But what you've converted to, the executable files, you can then pass around all your friends' computers and they can run it even though they haven't got the original program. Okay. 
Now, so anyone who teaches programming is going to be kind of dealing with these things anyway. So it's really just saying, look, let's just sit back and think about what the consequences of this are. One consequence is that, you know, if I, if I write something in C and I compile it, I can give everyone the executable file and they won't actually have a copy of my original C program. Um, so I kind of still retain control over it. Um, Whereas with Scratch, if I write a Scratch program and I upload it, everyone's got access to the program and they can edit it and change it themselves and wipe my name out and put the name in it. But another thing is that because every instruction is being understood as it's being executed, the interpreter has to do a whole lot of work for every instruction. And so it's going to be a lot slower, whereas with the compiler, it's all being converted to the, the, the low level language and everything will go faster. And there's, there's sort of a Lost over that really fast, but that's that's largely what's in there. It's, it's the idea that we've got compilers and interpreters, and, and that what will actually run on the computer and so on. Um, the reason for students to be aware of this is that there's really just the question: who actually writes the compiler? Who writes the interpreter? Computer scientists. Okay. And how do they write it? Well, they, they make up these rules about. Up, but they, they, they're given some rules about the language that you know, must have this word here and it must have that, and if you've got one of those, an opening bracket, it has to have a closing bracket. And they actually write computer programs that go through and say, oh, there's an opening bracket, I'm waiting for a closing bracket, and if there's not, I'm going to tell the person there's an error in their program. And so, so, so these things are programs, and the input to these programs are programs. Okay. And, and that's kind of a mind blowing concept that, that we're trying to get across at the level one is that. Scratch and C and Basic and all these things that are languages are actually programs that read in other programs and then can work to bring them to life. Um, and then, yeah, so, so those are both the three things I think we want. Um, level two, the three main concepts um, that students need to get around. Um, Representing data using bits, which is sort of the old binary numbers thing. How many people here would be confident in doing binary numbers and decimal? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else is thinking, I'm not putting my hands up, going to ask me to do it. But, uh, okay, I might, I might do a couple of quick things on that. Um, encoding, um, so compressing files, um, the students might be more familiar with this than some teachers, but MP3 files, for example. Uh, how much smaller is an MP3 file than a WAV file? Right. About 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 times, yeah, 10 times smaller, 10 percent of the size. So if, if I have a CD with WAV files on it and I were to put that on an MP3 player, I would, it would take 10 times the space of an MP3 file. And your students are probably already kind of familiar with this, but again, we want to step back and think, okay, who actually wrote that thing that converts it to MP3? And what's the value of it? What the world be like? If we didn't have MP3, everything is wave files, uninterested. And, and the experiments they can do, personalized ones, would be go through the playlist on your computer or whatever and measure how big it would be uncompressed and, and compressed. And oh, yep, sure, that one's 11% of the size, and that's 9%, and that's 20%. What's funny about that file? Um, what would happen if they're trying to compress three minutes of silence? That's, that's where you find the real scientists in there. Um, it turns out for MP3 that three minutes of silence takes about the same space as three minutes of Beethoven. Um, but for AAC, which is the method that Apple uses for iPods and so on, it takes almost no space because it's, it's really not, nice. it's actually not nice. um, and, and then the same compression also happens on cameras, so you've got JPEG files versus sort of raw files and so on. Um, you see this would actually time as media quite a bit too. And then encryption, um, which may sort of sound like secret codes and secret agents and so on, but every time you use a bank or do online purchases and so on, we've got an encrypted connection. And again, what would it mean if you could not have a secure connection between your home computer and the bank? Uh, it means anyone who's got access to your network can read all the information that you're typing in and transfer money. And, like um, and what are the big issues in encryption and so on? I'll, I'll talk about those. And then, uh, with interfaces, some usability heuristics and guidelines on what is usable. Um, okay, this is time for some exercise, I think. So, yeah, so who has done stuff with binary numbers? Okay, if you could stand up and come over here. I 
five-year-olds. So, <laughs> and you hopefully you'll see why. But um, the way that I want, I've got some cards here, and I'm going to get you to hold five cards for me. Um, the way I normally do it is that I give every student in the class a set of five cards on the table in front of them. And, and actually, right, I mean, you can make these cards very easily. They've just got lots on them. Um, the, um, I'm working on a marketing department. I'm trying to get them to, to provide free cards. As long as they've got a University of Canterbury logo on them, I think I can do it free. Um, so you get six of these cards. But anyway, here's the budget ones. Um, so on the right hand side, we, each of these people is a bit, and, and a bit is a you know, zero, one, one, and digit, one, and one. Um, the next bit is actually worth twice as much, so two dots. Okay. Um, how many dots here? Three. Three, yeah, which is what most classes will say. Mm -hmm. This is where my constructivist heart comes out. And all I do is I just put that there, and everyone goes, what? Hey, what? And then a few people will go, okay, the next one's going to be eight. eight. But the kids will often say, Five. Five or six. six. Yeah. yeah, it's obviously with the even numbers, one, two, four, and six, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and then the next one is, and then <coughs> most classes will now this as well, 16. And the next one would be? 72. And if I had another one? 64. And I won't go anymore, I just thought I'd do this out and count these geeks in the room, so that's fine. So, Okay, the, the, the way that we've done this with young people, and you obviously have to be able to do the problem is, is just say, I want this many dots shown. Okay? Now, so suppose um, I want uh, 19 dots shown. Okay? Do you want to have the 16? Yeah. It's black and white. Yeah. So you want the 16, the 8? No. No, because no. it would be too many, wouldn't it? Okay. Do you want the 4? No. 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 Do you want the 2? Yeah. Yes. Do you want the 1? Yeah. Okay. You just gave me a binary number by saying yes, no, no, yes, yes. Okay. Zero and one on computers is just a convenience that we use, but you can use any two symbols at all. And yes and no are actually quite good symbols to use. Um, so, so the number yes, no, no, yes, yes is actually representing the number 19. Okay. And then we can reason with this, like, is there another way to do the number 19? So, um, look out the cards. Um, so we can say, okay, suppose, suppose we don't use the 16 this time, would you be able to get 19? Can't because there's not 19 dots left. So sorry, we have to use the 16. We'll have that. Do you have? Um, what about the 8? Could we have the number 19 if the 8's shown? No. no. So it has to be hidden. And we can go through it and end up with a has to. The, the number 19 has to be done like that. Not that it could be done like that. But it has to. Be. <coughs> and, and so now I've got you thinking about the binary numbers and the idea that there's a unique representation for every number. If I were to ask your class what's the smallest number we can show here, they would say zero. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. They would say, what? Yeah. Um, and then there would be a pause for about a second and then someone would go, oh, zero. Okay. Um, and so let's show them another zero. Okay. Uh, sorry? If there's a word that uses the word show, if a shilling is the word show, it means actually see. Right, we can actually see them, yeah. It's a good point, actually. It's a trick question. And, and then one exercise I often do with the class, and, and again remember that this is typically with the students with the numbers in front of them on the table doing it for themselves, not with the whole group. It is hard, these guys can't actually see the whole picture while they're doing it, either, either, so it's hard, but, but it's, it's, it's an exercise. Um, so counting, if, if you do one, then two, we have to lose the one, we have to lose two, yeah, then three, that's right. And so the question is, how often does number one have to flip over? Every single time. Every single time. Flipping. Yeah. And what's special about those numbers when you can see your card? They're off. Yes. Because all the others are even numbers, and there's all this reasoning that's going on. And in fact, if we do the number um, zero, which is black, one 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 one, which is white. So that number is 15. <laughs> one less than that, yeah, right. and, and that's, yeah. So when you do the counting after a while, they'll see the pattern that whenever yeah. you have a whole lot of white ones in a row, it's one less than the next one. So we add one to 15 and we get 16. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, that's good. Um, and now if we have all of them white, so the largest number, how many dots there? Just reminding you that if there was another one, it would be 32. 31 dots there. Yeah. And, and in fact, normally these bits are stored on computers in groups of 8, called a 
right? And so the um, here's the other three. We'll go up to 128. So so how many dots are now shown with all these eight cards? 255. One less than what we get from doubling that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so now we've got the idea that you know we've got the numbers from zero to 255 with one five. We can represent that in different numbers. Um, if we had, say, SD, which is 8 bits, then we can only have 256 different characters with Unicode, which is 16 bits. Is that twice as many characters? No. Yeah, because every time we add one bit, it's twice as many in the range. And so you want the students to be comfortable with the idea that every bit you add is twice as many. With encryption, if you go from, say, a 54-bit um, a encryption code, so you're, you're 54 of these bits, and you go to 55 bits, it's twice as secure. It's twice as many different codes for people to try and crack and so on. Um, and so just getting comfortable with some of those sort of ideas. Um, one exercise that I will show you because it's kind of fun um, is converting these to, to letters. Um, and so this is not any of the known codes, normally it's SD or any code that we use, but I'm going to use this for simplicity. Um, and and I, I use sounds to represent the zeros and the ones. So I'm going to use a low sound, beep, for a zero, and a high sound, beep, for a one. Okay? And each number corresponds to a letter. And again, normally, more time we get kids to figure this out themselves. But, um, and in fact, I have a recording done by, and this is, um, this is actually Susan Dion, some of you may know her. She's a um, singing teacher at the jazz school. And she's, she's going to sing high and low notes. So we're ready to decode some text. Yeah. Oh, I'll just make sure it starts with the Okay, so bow is black. Bow, 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 bow. So the number is 10. And the letter is the tenth letter of the alphabet. So she just sung the letter J. Are okay, you ready for the next one? Here we go. Bo, 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 bo. Letter A. Bo, 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 bo. She thinks she's singing jazz. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So these are available for the download if you want to use them. Um, and, and again, you know, if a student said, you know, I listened to this thing, I decoded it like this, and that, that would be a great example of understands um, the uh, representing numbers as bits. But I've, I've got a couple of video studios in town that I work with who um, make these videos for me. And uh, for one, I just said, I'll oh, do something like that, but like a music video. Um, and they got a bit carried away. Uh, it's actually got 22 different codes in it, and uh, I'll just warm you up on the drum solo at the start. Okay, so it's bom bom ch bom bom, which is black black white black black, which is the number four, the letter D. And you can probably guess with this one, yeah. Um, as well as drums, the bass notes go bom bom bom, and Anyway, in the middle. 
Um, yeah, um, one family in the entire world has decoded this. It's been out for about a year. Uh, and because when, when you get to enough messages, it says, oh, now you've done this, you know, look at this line here, and, they'll be, and eventually it gives you a website, and, and if you go there, it gives you a password to type in and a few more things. But, uh, um, so if any of your students have got time to fill it, then um, they can decode all of that. Um, but I think the family that did it, they had a music teacher, a computer teacher, and a media expert or something else, and, you know, that they managed to sort of extract every bit of out of it. Yeah. Okay, thanks for having me. Um, on, on, the, on the insect side, was, uh, there's lots of other ways. So some of you may have seen um, the trick here, the sort of magic trick for binary numbers. That's like think of a number that's on all of these cards, and um, and basically it's a binary encoding of the number. That's uh, the magic trick. Um, and yeah. When we did these resources, there is just gazillions of resources for binary numbers out there. It's like everyone starts on binary numbers and then stops when they go to the next cool sort of application of the model. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so yeah, heaps, heaps of stuff for doing that. And then in the context of a device, you might be looking at a, at a camera which has got you know, a 16 bit cover or a player that's got 16 bit storage or, or what's a gigabyte, you know, it's got a gigabyte of memory. To look at. Moving on though, um, let's look at um, the coding side. And, um, so, error correction is one of the topics that comes up. Um, again, um, there's, there's, there's quite a cool magic trick that's on the Unplug site for this. We, we do, um, just, I, I won't go right through it. If anyone wants to hang out afterwards, if you haven't seen this before, I mean, you have seen this before, but, um, yeah. if you haven't seen it, you might do it afterwards. But basically, get a volunteer to put up a box of cards of two different colours um, and have the um, magician box away, flip one over and you can tell which one has been flipped over, apparently memorising the entire thing. Um, but the reality is it's just using the technique for parity of the correction, very straightforward. Um, which also, in fact I'll, I'll just go through it very briefly, the, it's used in rate discs for example, so if if you've got a system that has to be really reliable, um, then what you can do is, um, for a particular file, all the bits in the file, is you store one bit on every disk. Um, so you, and you have nine disks instead of eight. So what happens is if, if one of those disks dies, which they do from time to time, um, the, the, the parity rule says that the number of ones, or the number of black squares, is always an even number. So, so that one's died, and and that's some of our data there that's been lost. But we've got one, two, three, four black ones, so that one would have been white, would have been zero. And then in this row we've got three black ones, so that one must have been a one. And so what you do is you, you quickly pull that disk out of the rack, you put a new disk in, and reload it with all of those values, and, and now the whole thing is working again. And then if this one dies, again, you can work out what colour it would, you know, each of these value which these would have been from the other ones. If you've got two, you're in trouble. And, and that's exactly the sort of question we want students to be thinking about. Okay, so yeah, any error, just can correct it. Um, can, can, can put it back. But if two, if two go wrong, we can't. Now, that's one possible error correction system. There's other ones that are actually, when you have an individual disk, um, for every byte, they usually add about three bits to it so that if anything goes wrong with it, it's got half a chance of correcting it, or at least telling you that there's something wrong and not just giving you bad data. Um, but another system that's really um, widely used is for barcodes and um, checksums. Uh, so how many people come across the ISBN code? So, okay. so um, the, the, it's the international book number code, and the, those, those numbers there, the last digit is a check digit, and it's calculated based on the previous one. And basically, if any of those get typed in wrong, you can usually figure it out. So the rule for this book number is you take the digits, 9780, so 9780, multiply the first one by one, the next one by three, by one by three, by one by three, and so on. So you just alternate them. And you take the sum of those numbers, divide by 10, uh, get the remainder, um, base 11, and subtract it from 10. Anyway, it's, it's, it's all a bit 
convoluted, but it's a very simple process, really. Uh, and, and so that tells you that that, that last check number should be 9. Now, the thing is that, let's say I was typing this into an online system, or scanning a barcode in a shop or something like that, and it accidentally scanned an 8 instead of a 9 here. And the students could calculate through, OK, well, that would actually be 110, and you know, that number there would come out as a 1 or something. And, and say the check digit should be a, a 1, and it's actually a 9, and so you know that one of the numbers isn't correct. <coughs> um, now, the, the same happens with credit card numbers. Um, thanks. So, and, and, and this is a, is a really good um, spreadsheet exercise or, um, or a programming exercise. So, here is, here's a, what might be a credit card number, 499917 and so on. And the formula for that one is you multiply the, the first digit by 2, the next by 1, the next by 2, and so on. Um, and then whenever you get a double digit, you add those two digits together. So if you get 14, you add those to 5. Add all that up. And if the sum basically comes out as being a multiple of 10, then it's all correct. Does it, anyone got a credit card on them? Okay. Um, you'll just read out a number, but either you can change a number if you want, you can swap two numbers if you want, or you can give me your correct number. And I'd have to try and work out if you're giving me the correct number or not. Yeah, whole number? Whole number, yeah? Yeah. 4284. 4984. 6995. 6995. I'm just thinking actually, it's probably good not to give me the real number then. Yeah? 4143. 4143. Okay, now we don't know if you read me a correct one or not, but, but the sum, the sum is not a multiple of 10. So chances are that something was wrong with those numbers. Yeah, and I'm not an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> cool. But, you see, if you were writing a website that it's not a credit card number, it would immediately be able to say, sorry, you've made an error, rather than say, I have to go and look this up in a database or be back to you in a few seconds and decide if there's something wrong. So we know immediately. Yeah. Um, now, the question for the students, and, and for you, I guess, is, uh, well, can we figure out which one was wrong? In this case, it's the point of the system is not to figure out which one was wrong. Um, it's just to know that it was wrong. Um, but the other thing is that suppose we did have a correct credit card number, and I'll um, see if I can fiddle with this until it becomes uh, correct. So, yeah, okay. So that is a correct credit card number. It's probably not yours. No, it's not mine. <laughs> sure. Um, see, um, but, the, so, so given a sort of correct credit card number, is there a, an error that we could make in typing this number in that would still come out as a multiple of 10 and therefore make it look like it was correct? Mm -hmm. You just said. You just said. No. Uh, no, no, I mean, that, that's a correct one. So now suppose I go to type this in. You go to two numbers wrong. Yeah. If I type one digit wrong, that will not be 10. Okay. Yeah. So no matter what digit I type wrong, no matter what I change it to, it will not be a 10. That's the way. And, and so that's cool. So, yeah. So I have to change two numbers. and. Um, and if the, usually if two numbers get changed, the most common thing is, is for them to be transposed. So 42 might be changed to 24, but no, that knows that it's wrong. And so again, students can explore, well, what would actually um, you know, be the kind of error that it wouldn't detect? Okay. And this is not a fail-safe thing at all, it's just a very quick, quick and dirty check. 44 might work instead of 44? No. Yeah. 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 If you put it back up to two, which is change the fact of what the transposing and the transposing and just change one and nine, one and nine, then you then that adds up ten. So any one and nine. Okay, I'll probably just mark it up. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you can see that this is a great, and again, it's personalised. You know, the students can say, look, I, I figured out this number that would be a valid credit card number. Again, probably not the current one or something like that, but, but that would be okay. Um, it applies to all sorts of other, um, you know, um, what they call you know, frequent flyer numbers, and there's a lot of numbers that people put into systems. Yeah, bye bye, six years. Yeah. So, I mean, that in the real world, yeah. this is what happens at the kind of level where you don't see it, you just know that it's 
You just know it's wrong straight away. Yes, and that's why it's quick. Because I've often wondered, I mean, I haven't done much shopping online, but I've often wondered, well, how come it is so quick? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, and also it's some reassurance, <coughs> because if, if you are kind of like, especially if you buy something and you're about to put money in someone's bank account, you really want to be sure that you've got the right bank account. <coughs> well, chances are, if you've got a digit wrong, the bank will know straight away that you've got a digit wrong and, and just say, sorry, it's not a valid account. Even though it doesn't have access to those account details, it might be with another bank and so on. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, because um, they don't actually need to know. They just no. need to know no, that there's something wrong with the digits. Yeah. Um, like the code on the yeah. Right, that's, um, that, that's just that's a separate level of security. Yeah. So, so that's a much stronger level of security because... Um, Again, okay, based on the number? Uh, I don't think so, no. No, because, no, in fact it can't be, because if it was, anyone who got the credit card number could work out the validation code. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but these are exactly the kind of questions that security people ask themselves. So no, we have to make sure, and in fact we have to make sure it's not, you know, that it's a totally random number, and you know, so that no one could guess it. It's not based on anything, or and, and, and so yeah, there's all these kind of issues. But, but that's only a number of one per thousand, three yeah. issues. But what's the chance of someone guessing it? One in a thousand. They don't guess it. They do that. Yeah. Well, that's why banks cut you off what the three or four tries. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. If you make, make a couple of mistakes, yeah. then people know that you're Because there's no really a random number, really. No, because really you don't know. They've got some persons that you think they're Oh, randomly. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Well, 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 but, but, okay, so now you can see we've engaged in the issues that computer scientists worry about. Is it really random? Can we be sure? Is there a way around it? Um, and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and in fact, so that was, um, that wasn't even encryption, that was just, um, uh, yeah, um, there are teacher kind of questions. Yeah, it would be really good if we could capture the student demonstrated knowledge on Steam because they actually did it in the class as opposed to now we have the assessment or now we have the project. You see what I mean? Because you've said, hey, you recognise that we've demonstrated some understanding or us, you know, yeah. and yet we don't get... The, the only format that the ministry is interested in is 14 pages of yeah. aerial yeah. 12 point. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, which, which, is, which obviously is not the best way of assessing these things. Um, but, since it's what you're stuck with, you have to think of how do I translate what that student is. Okay, go and write that up, or go and explain that, or, or whatever. It's probably you know, going to be the best way of getting that through. I mean, often as teachers, we know who, who yeah. works at Oxford. We can say, oh, this student here is a miracle or an excellent student. Now, we know they don't trust us. That's the problem. Yeah. At the end of the day, they expect what you think you are. Yeah, but, but we don't trust the teachers to act as a well, well, actually, no, but you, you said it in the first place, but if I'm like this lady over here who did a program from teaching for the first time, I'm in the department of two, me and a maths teacher who actually stuck with the computer this year, I can understand those concerns. Yes. You know, I want to know, am I teaching it about where it should be? Yeah. And yeah. that's where you need, I think, to do I mean, I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying that, that yeah. near the, it is the, a low trust system. And the professional guidance, the professional judgment thing comes with experience having done that's it a right. number of times. Yes. That's when you know and the that's 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 We have got teachers who are experienced, who have got the ability to have professional judgment. Conversely, we've got those who haven't had the experience, who are on the there. Uh, there is another thing too. Sometimes when you're teaching kids, they appear to get it. Oh, yeah. But if you try to sit them down and get them to do a different, a slightly different exercise using the same ideas, yeah. you can very quickly tell they haven't a what they're doing. Yeah. So sometimes they do need to just sit down and explain. I, I won't dig too much into, yeah. into, into that, but yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. For encryption, um, so the real encryption the methods that are used these days are incredibly complicated mathematical systems. But this is a very simple one. The Caesar cipher, a lot of people have probably seen it used as examples in textbooks and so on. Very insecure, but it contains everything we need to explain the main, a lot of the main items that come up when you're dealing with encryption. So the way Caesar ciphers work is that you just shift every letter by, in this, well, the traditional one is by three, you add three letters to it. So A becomes D, B becomes the letter after D, and so on. Um, a great example of something that you get students to write a computer program for. 
But particularly how Krishna has given us code, <coughs> can you attack that? And now we've already used another word, attack, um, which is trying to decode an encrypted message. Um, what approach could you take? Single only going to be A or I. Right, so we've got a statistical attack that says that, that, that probably represents an I or an A. Um, and, you know, you two letter words, there's not many that they could be as well, and so on. Okay, so that's one attack, is a statistical attack looking for regularities in it. Um, and by the way, this is one of the things that got Germans into trouble during World War II, is that they like to always put Hell Hitler in their messages. And so people deciphering them could go, oh, well, I know that it ends with those letters, and they translate to this, so that gives us the leverage to figure out what the rest of the code is. Okay. Um, but the, um, so, so that's a statistical attack. There's another attack, and that is that this thing has, well, all, all encryption systems like this have what's called a key, which is like, if I tell you that everything is offset by three, then you can unlock it with that key. Yeah. Now, so, see, one of the things is just, what are all the possible keys for this? Well, it could be shifted by one, by two, by three, and so on. Um, yeah, there's only, well, there's 26 possible keys. There's really only 25, because shifting by 26 kind of the original. The original. Um, so what you could do is actually try out every possible key. We could shift it by one, and you go, oh, that's nonsense. Shift it by two, and that's nonsense. Shift it by, and, and so on. Eventually, you shift it by, I don't know what it is, but seven or something. And you go, oh, that's plain English, yeah. Um, so I've, I've, and that's called a brute force attack. Um, so here's another statistical attack. I've, I've counted how many times each letter occurs. So the letter O is the most common. It's 10% of them, and K is 9% and so on. And you start to have a guess based on the language and so on. Now, the, what we've got here now is a whole lot of terminology that you can talk about many times. Plain text is the original thing that was encrypted. The cipher text, that's the thing that you can't read. The attack, that's trying to figure out what it is without knowing um, a known plain text attack where you know what it's meant to be, you know how it's been coded, and based on that, you know well the key is that they've just added one to every letter. Right? So, and quite often, people in a known plain text attack, um, for example, if I know your bank account number and I know you're logging into the bank, um, and you know, lots of people know your bank account number, right? Um, then, if I look at the encrypted thing, I, then I know what, what that's encrypted. And modern systems, that's still basically impossible to attack. That. But that, that's the difference between a known plain text attack or a brute force attack, which you just try out every possible derivation or and so on. And so now we've, we've got the students, they, they haven't even touched a method that would really be useful in the real world, but, but the, they've got an idea of the issues. Um, and, 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 the, and the starting point again is just like, here's a code, how are you going to try and decode this? Um, and, and great programming exercises. Um, the, the third topic in there is human computer interaction. And it says to use um, heuristics, and basically these are the ones that we should use. Um, developed by a guy called Jacob Nielsen, and uh, again, the link to it is all over the place because they're, they're common, but it's uh, users.com is the, the website if you um, want to go straight there. Um, and it, it's just 10 guidelines that say that if you've got a really good usable system that people love to use, then it will follow these guidelines, and more to the point, if there's something about it that frustrates people, then it's probably breaking one of these guidelines. So, we were, you know, one of the problems with this might be that you know you press a button and you don't know if the battery's flat or the power's on or something like that. Well, Nielsen said that a good system, <laughs> uh, a, a good system uh, will give appropriate feedback. Okay? Visibility of the system state, as you can tell if it's on or off. It's so a very, very first rule. Um, uh, I up, our Zimwell box has a red LED on it, but the red LED is on when the box is turned off. And when you turn it on, there's no LED showing at all. Right. So you have no idea whether it's on or not plugged in. That's a great example. Actually, we've, we've got some locks in our building like that. Um, I'm sure if you can look this up. Um, these are magnetic locks on the door, and so, you know, running late. To go home, go barreling through the door, and, and the light on it tells you if it's locked or not. And it's got either a red light or a green light. <laughs> so green means it means it's locked. And the reason is that, and, and you know, some heuristics when you look at them, they say it should be from the user's point of view. It's from the security person's point of view. Green, good, it's secure, safe. 
uh, risk, dangerous, so insecure. Yeah. So it's not from the user's point of view, it's just for a different user, it's for the security guards who are looking at the going to be safe, that's good. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's very easy to, to find examples of this. So one of them is user control and freedom. Um, you know, people will make mistakes, so they need to have ways of getting out of where they are, you know, not feel locked into something. The classic one is the start button that you use to stop Windows from. Um, where most people figure out pretty quickly. Um, you know, uh, consistency in standards, they shouldn't have to wonder whether different words in different situations mean different things. Um, this is a cell phone that I, I used to have. I love it because you type in a text message and when you type in the message, what's the first thing you want to do with it? Send. send. What's the send button do? Delete everything and make a phone call. That's the meaning of send. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you should know that because it's green and green Send buttons mean make a phone call. Right? Um, now, the good thing is, yeah, so this whole interface thing is a good chance to have a good laugh at all those things that you felt like smashing with the time and, and probably need counseling for and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and so, um, you know, another guideline of the 10 is error prevention. That there should be good error messages that, um, that well, sorry, better than good error messages, not even let people do things that are wrong. Um, and, and so well, actually a, a good positive example of that is you know, if you grey something out, um, as opposed to you know, go to a restaurant, do you want the fish to be for the chicken? It's like, oh, I've got the fish. Oh, I've got the fish, sorry. Yeah. Oh, what do you like? Oh, beef there. Oh, we don't have beef. Uh, oh, chicken? Yep, sure, chicken. Good choice there. Okay, so, um, and, and, and you probably come across systems like that where they offer things that actually aren't available. Like that. So, so preventing errors. Um, so anything that kind of induces you to do something out to be an error. So a lot of this is, is about um, we you know people might think about the system as you know this, this box here whatever that's the computer system. The real system is that box plus me. That, that's the system that has to work really well. And for people to design interfaces that really work they have to understand this part of the system. And um, and a lot of computer scientists don't naturally understand that part well. Uh, and, it's, and so one of the subliminal messages is here, you really do have to understand people. The people who design amazing interfaces have usually got a quite a bit of psychology, um, sociology, even physiology, how the body actually works and that sort of stuff. Yeah, and so if you look at it, why are like Apple products popular? Um, usually they design something, they test it, they find that people love, love some things about it and hate it, or they test it again, they test it again. Thousands and thousands of dollars spent on testing and paying people to come in and try it out and not sign the disclosure agreements and all sorts of things like that. There's a company in town that does this full time called LeftClick, um, so you may have heard of it. And they will test websites and software for people. They, they bring in the demographic that's going to use it. So, you know, if, if some programmer designs the next cool gadget and they say, oh, this is so cool, I can use it for everything I want. But if you're not selling it to programmers, then you've probably missed your demographic. And, and so if it's if it's an age for retired people or people with bad sight or something like that, you need to bring in lots of people with bad sight or lots of retired people to try this out, um, rather than just uh, to say, oh, you know, it's got all the features that you need and this would be great. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, heaps of opportunities for students to personalise it. Just find any interface or device that frustrates people and especially watch someone else use it. Um, watch, you know, first of all, we'll figure out what they want to do with it, what the tasks are. Um, and you know, watch them use it and do an honest assessment of what's good and bad about it. Um, the, the worst thing that you can do is say, I like this program and it's got this interface and it looks really good to me. It's got colored buttons and it's all beautifully laid out and it's like failed straight off because um, it, it's not really you think it's good, it's whether someone who didn't write it can assess whether, you know, what the weaknesses are. Every interface is going to have weaknesses and I don't, don't think I've come across the perfect interface. And, Maybe a light switch or something, but even those could probably be from proof. Well, it's here if it does that much. Yeah, it's that much. It's that much. It's that much. It's that much. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, just, just getting back to the big picture. Um, you know, the, the whole goal. Um, um, the, the, the whole goal is for your students to just have a taste of why these things are issues, to start to debate them, to start to think, ah, oh, if I learned a bit more maths, or if I learned a bit more about this, or a bit more about these algorithms, or whatever, maybe I'd find some better ones, um, and just open your minds to, to those possibilities, um, and get away from the idea that, well, if I can program, I can just make things happen. 
reliable. This, I mean, the, the cool stuff that's reliable and efficient and effective and usable and fun and all those sort of things is built by people who've got a broad view of all of those concepts so that they can bring in the security, they can bring in the speed, they can hire someone who's good at that and someone who's good at that in a particular system that the users are going to love. And I'm going to pick it to Oh, wow. That's everything in an hour and a quarter. I'll just interrupt this group as well really quickly. Next door, there's a couple of computer groups and kids that have made a um, 3D printer and they've got all set up.